Know Thyself, A Guide to Recognizing the Essential Self by Ron Clark. In Hermetics, like any other system of philosophy, we use a variety of terms which may or may not be used commonly without really defining the specific meaning we wish to convey with their use. Most often, we intend to communicate something more with them than their common, everyday definitions would imply, and it is assumed that you either already know what distinguishes their use from the ordinary meaning, or you will figure it out. One such term is self, and although it is true that if you are seriously pursuing the work of Franz Bardon's initiation into Hermetics, you will eventually be led to an understanding of its Hermetic use, it is nonetheless very advantageous if you have prior knowledge and can recognize the essential self from the outset. Clarifying what is truly meant to be communicated by this seemingly simple word in the Hermetic context will be the subject of all that follows and, as usual, this will be an experiential journey, not just an intellectual one. Self is a very complex, multi-layered combination of factors whose definition varies depending upon one's perspective. Nonetheless, we can define an essential, or core self, with a capital S, from which all of these layers spring, and to which all of the various factors cling. Simply put, the essential self is the intentional aspect of our overall awareness, which is capable of objective perception and expression. The words intentional and objective are important here, because the essential self is always intentional, and objective. It is this quality that distinguishes it from the other aspects of human consciousness which make up the overall awareness. Our overall or mundane awareness is a mixture of intentional and unintentional factors. The intentional aspect can be equated with the so-called conscious mind and the unintentional aspect with the so-called subconscious mind. However, I don't particularly like these terms for hermetic use, since they don't really speak in any practical way to the true differences and connections between these factors. So I will abandon them and stick to intentional and unintentional. It's the intentional awareness that looks at an object and perceives its details. It's the unintentional awareness that simultaneously perceives everything else in the field of peripheral vision outside of the intentional focus, and normally the unintentional awareness is what places all of these perceptions into personal emotional context. The intentional awareness thinks things through before speaking. The unintentional awareness colors all of those thoughts by relating them to memories and emotional attitudes. The intentional awareness is spontaneous and in the moment the unintentional awareness is habitual and always seeks to relate the present moment to past moments. Of course, the intentional awareness is capable of reshaping the contents of the unintentional awareness and of thus intentionalizing those contents. This is essentially the process of character transformation described in steps 1 and 2 of initiation into Hermetics. Once the transformation of the unintentional awareness's subjectifying content is complete, it can then be used objectively by the intentional awareness in perception and expression. In other words, it becomes a tool of the essential self instead of something that obscures the essential self. From here on, we will concern ourselves primarily with the intentional aspect of awareness since this is our route to understanding the essential self. The intentional awareness has a twin nature. It is both a perceiver and an expressor, either sequentially or simultaneously. It perceives its external environment and or itself, and it expresses itself by transforming itself and or its environment. Perception is watery and magnetic. The perceiver is affected by the perception and in some way transformed by the experience. When we perceive something, we experience the objective effects that the object of perception exerts upon our senses, and simultaneously we experience the reaction to those effects generated by the subjectifying aspects of our awareness. 
perception places the perceiver into context with the universe. Perception is physically, astrally, and mentally nourishing. It exercises and stimulates our senses and thus energizes our bodies. It broadens our range of experience and causes us to grow and evolve. Expression, on the other hand, is fiery and electric. Expression seeks to change the universe so that it comes into context with us or in some way reflects our essence. In expression, we release and externalize our inner content. We then learn and grow by evaluating the success or failure of our expression and thus the contextual appropriateness of our expression evolves. Expression itself is physically, astrally, and mentally depleting. It drains us of energy as we externalize our inner content. However, we gain considerable nourishment in the process of perceiving the results of our expression and reaping the benefits when our expression has been successful, so much so that this can far outweigh any depletion. As I noted earlier, perception and expression can occur separately or simultaneously. It can be said that the emotional reaction we generate in response to perception is an action of the expressive awareness, and similarly that we cannot express without simultaneously perceiving the effects of our expression. Like fire and water, electric and magnetic, perception and expression are sides of the same coin. Perception and expression occurs either in a subjective mode or an objective mode, or most usually as a combination of these two modes. Subjective mode is earthy. It's all about personal context. For example, when we smell an aroma, we immediately associate it with memory and an emotional valuation of good, bad, or indifferent, and thus interpret the aroma in the context of our heretofore accumulated personal experience. Objective mode, on the other hand, is airy, and is all about distancing oneself from personal contextualization. Objective mode perceives the aroma as it is, instead of as how we feel about it, and what memories we may have that relate to it. Another example is the sensation of cold. In subjective mode, we suffer and shiver and experience cold as a thing to be avoided. In objective mode, we note the perception of cold and its effects upon our body, but without an emotional valuation of good or bad. It simply is, and we don't suffer even if we are shivering. In the context of the expressive awareness, subjective mode is very emotive and personal. Conversely, objective mode is very dispassionate and impersonal. It's an expression which reflects a broader context than the purely personal. An angry tirade is an example of subjective mode expression, and the step two mental exercises from initiation to hermetics, where you're isolating each sense, even from the emotions, and using them creatively, is an example of objective mode expression. With perception, objective mode is the most nourishing since it entails no creative subjectification and thus no s expenditure of energy. Furthermore, objective perception is a much more holistic experience and more growth ensues. With expression, subjective mode is the more nourishing since it exercises and stimulates the self-contextualizing and self-affirming aspects of the personality. Subjective mode expression is ultimately more holistic than objective expression. By nature, the intentional awareness primarily perceives and expresses by focusing itself, either upon the object of perception or the receptacle of expression. It is also capable of rejecting focus entirely and entering a non-focal state of pure being, akin to Bardon's step one emptiness of mind but we won't dwell on that possibility just yet, since it has little to do with the initial recognition of essential self. The intentional awareness can expand and contract its focus. It can limit its field of perception or expression to a single infinitely finite point, or it can expand its field to encompass infinity itself, 
all by an act of will or intention. It can hold just a singular focus, or it can expand to engage many focal points simultaneously. In this regard, the intentional awareness is very fluid and adaptive, capable of adopting any shape or size it wishes. The intentional awareness can also move its self-aware focus from one place to another. For example, it can focus itself within your right big toe, and then relocate its focus to your left thumb. Similarly, it can project its self-aware focus from its normal anchoring in your own physical body into an external object or person. It can focus upon the contemplation of one idea and then engage another idea in the next moment. All of these are aspects of its motive power to relocate its self-aware focus. As I stated earlier, our normal, mundane awareness manifests as a combination of intentional and unintentional factors. However, Western society is generally built around encouraging the unintentional and subjective factors of awareness and inhibiting the intentional and objective factors. A good example of this is the invasive presence of commercial advertisements which manipulate the unintentional subconscious subjectifying awareness into purchasing brand X because it will make you feel good, sexy, happy, etc. Unfortunately, this sort of consumption-based manipulation is present in nearly all aspects of Western culture. We see it in politics, in the educational system, in medicine, science, and religion, and so on. In the face of such overwhelming and intrinsic manipulation, most become used to living in the unintentional subjective mode and have little inkling of the immensely powerful intentional objective awareness that slumbers within. Once recognized, though, the intentional objective awareness of the essential self begins to permeate the whole of one's existence and little by little becomes the true seat of mundane awareness. This unleashing of the intentional objective powers of the essential self is the major portion of the early work of Hermetic Initiation. In the very first exercises of Step 1, the intentional objective awareness is focused inwardly, upon the mind and character and the body. Although it is nowhere stated that the student is immediately exercising their essential self in this perceptual process of self-examination and self-discovery, it still has the effect of rending the first veil and setting in motion a self-revelatory process. In step two, the veil is further rent through combining the expressive, creative power of the intentional objective awareness with its perceptual powers. In the mental exercises, the student uses their expressive, intentional objective power as they work creatively with each of their senses in isolation while simultaneously using their perceptual intentional objective powers to perceive and evaluate their sensory creations. With the astral exercises, the student employs their intentional objective creative power in the transformation of their character, while simultaneously exercising their intentional objective perceptual powers in monitoring of the character's habitual nature. And finally, with the physical exercises, the student uses their expressive intentional objective powers to create desired states within their physical body, while simultaneously strengthening their perceptual intentional objective power to experience and verify those states. All in all, the work of Step 2 begins to shift the seat of awareness away from the unintentional subjective and leads it firmly towards taking root in the intentional objective. Step 3 firmly sets the seat of awareness to intentional objective mode by training the intentional objective awareness how to work with the intentional subjective awareness. This is seen in the finalization of the character transformation in which the unintentional content that rules the subjectifying awareness has been objectively intentionalized. This transforms the subjectifying character into an objectively intentional creature that expresses the essential self. 
The Step 3 mental, astral, and physical exercises also affect the same unification of the objective and subjective powers of the intentional awareness by working with multisensorial creations that evoke subjective responses amidst objective expression. If the work of Step 3 has not successfully and permanently shifted the seed of normal awareness to that of the intentional objective awareness of the essential self, then the work of Step 4 will be nearly impossible to accomplish. This is most noticeable when it comes to the mental transplantation of consciousness, because only the intentional objective awareness is capable of transferring its self-awareness from one place to another. Likewise, with the astral exercises, only the intentional objective awareness is capable of truly connecting with the elements sufficient for their accumulation, and only the intentional objective awareness is capable of shifting its focus from one internal body part to another. And as many have discovered in working with the physical exercises of Step 4, only the intentional objective awareness of the essential self is capable of successfully and wisely wielding the expressive powers of the elements without causing self-harm. When Franz Bardon wrote Initiation into Hermetics, the world was just at the beginning of the commercial age, which has so drastically inhibited easy access to the intentional objective awareness within Western society. In his time, I imagine that pursuing the work of the steps would have fairly rapidly unveiled the nature of the essential self to the student. Today, however, the situation is somewhat different, and many are having difficulty with this point. It is, as I stated at the outset, my hope that the series of meditations and exercises which follow will help lead all those who are pursuing the work of initiation into hermetics very rapidly to the recognition of their essential self, and thus make their progress that much easier and secure. My best to you. Know Thyself Meditation 1 Physical Perception by Ron Clark In this meditation exercise we will explore the nature of perception through our physical senses. We will identify the different aspects of awareness involved and examine the roles that each play in physical perception. In order to effectively fulfill this task, there are certain environmental details that must be seen to first. Perform this meditation exercise in a room where you are assured privacy for the duration. Your room needs to be moderately lit, not too bright nor too dim, and contain at least one object for you to look at. The nature of this object doesn't matter. You must be able to sit or recline comfortably without having to expend any energy to keep yourself upright. The ideal position for this meditation exercise is reclining, with your head slightly elevated above your chest and your chest slightly elevated above your abdomen. This can be achieved by lying on your back with a couple of pillows propped beneath your head and shoulders. Since we will be working with all of the physical senses, you will also need to have readily available something to taste something to smell, and something to hear. It doesn't particularly matter what items you choose so long as they can be sensed through taste, smell, and hearing. In regard to sound, it would be best if you can work in a non-soundproofed room and thus rely on environmental sounds external to your room. But if that isn't possible, I recommend a small bell or a piece of pottery or glass that you can make ring by gently tapping it. So, pause this recording and assemble everything you need. Once everything is ready, make yourself as physically comfortable as you can and take a few moments to get settled. So, to begin. Focus your eyes on the object you have chosen to observe visually. In the few moments you have been looking at your object, several things have transpired, all of which together 
have constituted your perception of this object. However, the only information your eyes have provided are the objective details of your object. All the rest of the information within your perception has come from other sources. Look very intently at your object now and intentionally note each of its objective attributes. Note its size, its shape, its texture, its colors, and so on. These are the objective details that your eyes reveal to your intentional awareness. Now take notice of the emotional feelings and reactions that the objective details of your object evoke within you. How does its shape make you feel? Or each of its colors? its size, its texture. At first, these emotional responses involve you and you truly experience them. But now I want you to consider them objectively, without any direct involvement. Note them and accept them as objective facts. Focus your eyes on one specific aspect of your object at a time and objectively perceive your spontaneous emotional reaction to each one. And now look at the object as a whole and objectively perceive your emotional reaction to the whole. These spontaneous emotional reactions to the objective visual information arise from within the unintentional awareness and are rooted in your past experience with the same or similar objective details that are possessed by your object. This input from the unintentional awareness gives each object of detail personal meaning. Take a few moments now to once again observe the objective details of your object and again perceive the emotional responses that arise. But try to trace these emotional responses back to the memories that founded them.
Throughout the past few minutes of looking at your object and of perceiving your emotional responses to its features, you may have noticed an internal voice that provides a running verbal description of what you are perceiving. It voices your thoughts as they occur and gives names to everything you are perceiving and feeling. This voice also has its origin in the unintentional awareness, and it is the means by which the unintentional awareness intellectually integrates your perception of the objective details with your emotional responses. It acts like a glue that holds the objective details and their emotional significance together in a way that you can comprehend. When your attention is focused, the inner dialogue will naturally pertain in some way to your focal object. When your mind is unfocused, however, the inner voice becomes mind chatter, and it can then range over a broad spectrum of topics, ideas, feelings, etc., ultimately reflecting the contents of the unintentional awareness. Once again, view the objective details of your object, and this time, objectively note the contents of your inner dialogue. Now shift your attention to your emotional reactions and note the dialogue that accompanies them as well. Ordinarily, the inner dialogue and our emotional valuations provide information that we do not objectively evaluate or verify. In fact, we are most often oblivious to its existence as the major portion of perception. Take a moment now to compare the objective information perceived by your eyes with the subjective information provided by your emotional reactions and internal dialogue. How much, if at all, have your emotional reactions and inner dialogue distorted, informed, or transformed your perception 
of the objective details. What you have just accomplished is intentional objective perception. You have intentionally perceived the objective details of your object and you have objectively perceived the subjectifying responses of your unintentional awareness to those objective details. Even though your perception included a great amount of subjective information from your unintentional awareness, you nonetheless perceived it with your intentional objective awareness. Your intentional objective awareness is, of course, your essential self. Next we will use our intentional objective awareness to perceive sound. Close your eyes and focus your awareness upon your hearing. Listen for external noises or ring your bell and focus intently upon your perception of the sound. Note its objective details of pitch, loudness, duration, rhythm, and so on. And now focus upon how you feel emotionally about this sound. Does it please you, or displease you, or neither? Note the contents of your accompanying internal dialogue and objectively perceive its relevance. Note that when perceiving sounds whose origins you cannot see, your mind generates its own images to describe the sound's origin. These are closely related to your internal dialogue and emotional reactions and share the same subjective source within your unintentional awareness. With your intentional objective awareness, observe the images that your mind puts forth to depict the sound's origin or cause.
Now compare the differences between the objective details of the sound and the subjective content provided by your unintentional awareness. Next, we will use our intentional objective awareness to perceive aroma. Focus your awareness upon your sense of smell. Inhale the aroma of your chosen item and focus intently upon your perception of its scent. Note its objective details and note what parts of your olfactory organ are affected by the aroma. And now focus upon how you feel emotionally about this scent. Does it please you or displease you or neither? Note the contents of your accompanying internal dialogue and objectively perceive its relevance. Note that when perceiving an aroma, your mind immediately tries to define it, tries to name what it is you're smelling through images. These are closely related to your internal dialogue and emotional reactions and share the same subjective source within your unintentional awareness. With your intentional objective awareness, observe the images that your mind puts forth to define the aroma. Now compare the differences between the objective details of the scent and the subjective content provided by your unintentional awareness.
Next, we will use our intentional objective awareness to perceive flavor. Focus your awareness upon your sense of taste. Lick, sip, or take a small bite of your chosen item and focus intently upon the perception of the flavor. Note the objective details of the flavor you perceive with your tongue. And now, focus upon how you feel emotionally about this taste. Does it please you, or displease you, or neither? Note the contents of your accompanying internal dialogue and objectively perceive its relevance. Now compare the differences between the objective details of the flavor and the subjective content provided by your unintentional awareness. Next we come to our exploration of perception through our sense of touch or physical feeling. There really is no adequate name for this sense. The terms touch and tactile merely cover one aspect of all that this sense reveals to our awareness. The tactile aspect is geared toward sensing the external environment and is reliant upon nerve endings within the layers of skin, capable of detecting objective environmental factors such as texture, temperature, and pressure. The non-tactile aspect, on the other hand, is geared toward sensing our internal environment, such as a muscular ache, an itchy patch of skin, or intestinal gas, and is likewise reliant upon specialized nerve endings, except that these include sensory nerves spread throughout our body's deeper tissue and bone. Ultimately, this is the sense that most ties our awareness to our physical body and to physical existence. It also pervades or influences perception through our other four physical senses. For example, if what we are looking at is too bright, we feel discomfort in our eyes. If a sound is too loud or too shrill, we likewise feel discomfort in our ears. And in both smell and taste, Tactile sensations are involved as you 
draw air in through the sinuses, and take food or drink into the mouth. Each of these tactile sensations that occur during the process of perception, subtly or not so subtly, influence the resulting perception, especially at an emotional level. For example, if it physically hurts our eyes to look at something, we stop looking at it, and form a negative emotional memory that keeps us from looking at similar should we encounter it again. Conversely, if it gives us physical pleasure to look at a thing, then we keep looking and form a positive emotional memory that leads us to seek out the observation of similar things. The perceptions of physical feeling are normally processed by the unintentional subjective awareness before they even register within the intentional awareness. In other words, we create an immediate emotional valuation of the sensation. This is a biologically hardwired feature of instinctive self-preservation which generates an immediate response to physical threat. For example, when you touch something so hot that it burns your fingertip, your hand immediately withdraws without your having to first think, oh, that's too hot. I better not leave my finger there while the skin melts. In spite of this biological imperative of self-preservation, we are quite capable of intentional objective perception through and with this sense. We cannot, of course, eliminate the unintentional subjective component, but we can observe it objectively and without involvement, and take it as a piece of objective information concerning how the sensation affects us. So, let's get back to our exploration and put these words and ideas into practice. Once again, close your eyes and sense the air temperature of the room you're in. Is it warm, cool, or just right? Note the value judgment inherent in determining the temperature. It is completely based upon the variation of the temperature from your comfort zone. If the temperature is lower than this zone, then you judge it cool. If higher, then you judge it warm. The only objective information revealed is the relationship of the actual air temperature to your personal comfort level. Now let's turn the sense inward and perceive the interior of our own bodies. Notice the sensation of the air entering your sinuses as you inhale or passing over your tongue if you're breathing through your mouth. Focus your awareness upon the exact physical location of this sensation and experience it closely. Again, there is the immediate value judgment of relative warmth or coolness of the air and of its relative goodness or badness. But beyond this emotional reaction to the physical sensation, there is the objective experience of the sensation. The objective experience includes the unintentional subjective valuations, but it's more than just how we feel about the sensation. It's also our actual, real-time experience of the sensation as it is occurring. Focus your intentional awareness upon this experience of the sensation of the inhaled air passing over nerve endings and ignore any emotional value judgments that arise.
Now follow this sensation inward. Sense the air as it touches deeper areas of your sinuses and then throat. With each inhalation, follow the sensation deeper and deeper until you actually feel the air filling your lungs. Now expand your focus so that you are sensing your entire chest area as a whole. Experience the feeling of your chest expanding with each inhalation and contracting with each exhalation. Now expand your awareness still further so that you experience the sensation of your entire physical body as a whole. Spend a few moments here now experiencing what it feels like to be in your physical body. Freely allow the subjective emotional judgments to arise and let them inform you of your emotional attitudes about your own body. Focus again on the sound of my voice and gently return to an awareness of your surroundings. Open your eyes and sit up from your reclining position while I say a few words. I hope that from this brief exploration you have learned a few important things about physical perception. First among them 
is the degree to which our unintentional subjective awareness influences the process of perceiving. And second is the degree to which our intentional objective awareness can intercede in the process of perception and make of it something much more informative. When left to the unintentional subjective awareness, perception informs us mostly about ourselves and about how we relate to the world. But when we intercede with our intentional objective awareness, perception begins to inform us about the objective reality that exists separate from our emotional reactions to it. It also provides us with an objective perception of our own subjectifying content and its relationship to the objective reality. Use of our intentional objective awareness reveals the subjective filter through which we normally perceive the world and ourselves. I suggest that during the coming days and weeks you use the faculties of intentional objective awareness in your acts of perception. Truly see the things you look at and experience the sensations you encounter. Savor them to their fullest and draw from them their objective meanings hidden among your subjective reactions. Use your senses and your awareness to spend time truly experiencing life within the miracle of your own body. My best to you.